The annual budget process for the United States government has become a persistent battleground for political posturing. For many of us, hearing about the battles fought in Washington, D.C. is frustrating and ridiculous. How hard should it be to decide how much funding each department needs and pass an appropriations bill for that department? Why is there so much drama over some funding items and none at all on others? If we're going to look at these questions, then it's time for some roasted opinions. The U.S. government began a partial shutdown just before Christmas, guaranteeing that the new Congress will start with a nasty fight over appropriations which the President has said he is willing to last for months or even years. This is the third shutdown of 2018, although the second lasted just nine hours and had virtually no effect. The past Congress started with some terribly negative ratings and did little to change public opinion about them. With both houses in the hands of Republicans and precedent for changing the House rules to allow votes, one might think that Congress could have moved forward on much of the agenda that Trump proposed to get the country back on its feet after a long, slow, jobless recovery from the double-dip recession which plagued the Obama years. Instead, an inability to enforce party discipline in the narrowly held Senate allowed the Democrats to hold up bills and nominations, turning the business of the people into more business as usual during the two years of the 115th Congress, they approved budget deficits of nearly $1.5 trillion. The national debt increased by almost $2 trillion as interest on the debt compounded the issue. Projections indicate that both of these numbers will only increase in the 116th Congress, leaving the United States with a national debt in excess of $25 trillion by 2020. How did the national debt get so out of control, and why does the government keep shutting down every few months? Despite Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the Constitution specifying that Congress must appropriate funds, it neither specifies that there must be an annual budget, nor requires that the budget be balanced. It only states that for the federal government to spend money, then Congress must pass a bill to authorize that spending. It also specifies that the appropriations must begin in the House of Representatives in Article 1, Section 7, Clause 1, which doesn't bode well for future negotiations on appropriations given that the Democrat Party has just taken control of the House and are convinced that they have a mandate to shut down the President's agenda. The Republican majority in the Senate has increased in the same election, which will keep a lot of the partisan infighting within the Congressional Conference Committee who will meet to reconcile differences in versions of bills passed in both houses. I expect to see a lot of posturing between Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell as each will try to blame the other for gridlock and we've already begun to see this. This is not how an effective legislature should function. Um, no, just no. I really cannot predict what will happen in any detail, as I'm certain that new issues will arise as time goes by. The closer that we get to the 2020 general election, the greater the partisanship will become. Beyond that, no specific prediction of mine stands much chance of coming to pass. I'm not going to waste your time making a bunch of grand pronouncements about how the 116th Congress will address these issues. Instead, I'm going to address the problems that our government has when budgeting money and suggest solutions. These are my opinions. If you have ideas, go ahead and comment below to share them. Perhaps, if we pool our ideas together, we can come up with a workable solution to the failed budgetary process. First, I have to address continuing resolutions. These are temporary measures to appropriate funding for existing programs at the levels projected by those programs and recommended by the Congressional Budgetary Office, or CBO. No new programs can be proposed in a continuing resolution, but programs that were authorized on separate bills are included into continuing resolution appropriations that follow them as existing programs. The problem with this is that neither the bills which authorize new programs nor the continuing resolutions are budgets. Continuing resolutions are the budgetary equivalent of kicking the can down the road as the nominal purpose of a continuing resolution is to hold spending at current levels while both houses of Congress continue to debate the budget. In fact, the actual effect of a continuing resolution does not hold spending at previous levels. Since 2005, at least, though, Appropriations for the entire federal budget have not been passed by the September 30th deadline set by Congress. 
In some years, the budget was not fully funded until halfway through the fiscal year that it covered. This is absolutely not acceptable as a routine practice. Continuing resolutions cannot replace the budget process. Budget appropriations bills authorize funding for an entire fiscal year at a time. In point of fact, budget appropriations could be considered at the start of each Congress, which would mean that basic funding for the federal government would be in place for two years at a time. New programs and the appropriations associated with them would then be added to the budget individually over the duration of that session of Congress. The budget would also have to allow for projected increases in the cost of budgeted programs. A biennial budget process would make it possible to rein in pork barrel spending somewhat, but it could also lead to more budget problems as unforeseen expenditures exhaust the budgeted funds well before the next budget takes effect. 19 states currently use a biennial budget approach, with four meeting biennially and 15 meeting annually to discuss the budget. The possibility of budgeting biennially has been studied by the CBO and others, and their reports do make for some interesting reading. By the traditional rules of each house and by acts of Congress, both houses consider new appropriations using a pay-as-you-go approach, or pay-go, which means that the Congress is authorizing the borrowing for the deficit included in the appropriation. The debt ceiling which Congress debates raising every year is part of this. If Congress does not include deficit reduction legislation in the budget, then a portion of the funding is sequestered or withheld across the scope of the department being appropriated funding. These measures were enacted in 2010 and were supposed to bring about an end to budget deficits. So let's look at the figures. In 2010, thanks to Affordable Care Act and measures to assist with the continuing poor economy, the deficit reached nearly $1.3 trillion, and that was down from $1.4 trillion the previous year. Five years later, it had fallen to $438 billion. Yet it began to steadily rise again despite growth, which was steadily increasing and which exploded in 2017. Now, there has to be a better solution than what we have enacted so far. After all, the Congress, during the latter half of Bill Clinton's presidency, managed to craft budget surpluses, and those aren't the only time in our nation's history when we have put together a surplus. Back during the Coolidge administration in the 1920s, the budget surpluses were large enough that 25% of the national debt was actually paid off by the end of his administration. In more recent times, the budget hasn't had a less than $100 billion deficit since the start of the global war on terror. The cost of fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq drove defense appropriations through the roof. Now, the best solution to this particular spending problem is to scale back or eliminate operations in the Middle East, which would significantly reduce the support costs needed for the units brought back home to the states. That's ostensibly the reason which Democrats cited in the beginning of 2018 for pulling out, which President Trump just announced would happen. Over those months, I guess the Democrats forgot that this was their demand in April, because their position in December is the complete reverse. The defense budget could potentially be further reduced if proper accounting procedures were followed by the DOD. This has been an ongoing issue, and it needs to be resolved once and for all. Now, the defense of our nation is one of the functions of the federal government, which is most in keeping with the framers' intent, in my opinion. I'm also a retired soldier and a conservative, so you know that I support giving the DOD the money that they need to provide for the common defense. The fact that I am willing to reduce expenditures in the DOD budget should tell you just how serious I take this situation. Spending is out of control. Congress has been passing budgets at the halfway point of the fiscal year, roughly the time when they are supposed to be passing the upcoming budget, leaving them a year behind in their business. The national debt is big enough now that servicing the interest on the debt is now 8.3% of a multi-trillion dollar annual budget. This cannot continue indefinitely, and most people are interested in deficit reduction. Except if your name is Ocasio-Cortez, and you think that the pay-go rule needlessly limits spending for your social programs. Now that's just my opinion. Comment below to share yours. If you like this video, check out my playlists. Check out these channels I have subscribed for more great content. New episodes are coming, so subscribe and ring the bell.